Welcome back to Why Should We Care About African Data Centers, a podcast where we tackle the big questions shaping the industry. I'm Ville Vakli. Today we are asking, if you build, will the hyperscalers come? In the data center world, hyperscalers are the giants. Think of AWS, Google Cloud and Microsoft Azure. They run massive data centers, powering everything from AI to cloud services. Hyperscalers often build their own infrastructure, but also lease co-location space when it makes sense. Many in Africa are preparing for their arrival, but is that bet going to pay off? We speak with data center operators, infrastructure experts and vendors to explore what it really takes to attract hyperscalers and whether Africa is ready. From power and policy to AI and shifting design demands, it's a moving target and the stakes are high. Whether you're an investor, operator, policymaker, or just curious about the backbone of the internet, this podcast is for you. Let's get started. I spoke with Sean Worsfeld from Royal Haskening about what hyperscalers expect from co-location providers. Yeah, so they've got quite a specific need when they look at say kind of the data center providers or the data center builders in terms of the guys doing the land banking, the boarding of these DCs. What we see from a lot of that is that the, some of the critical things is say getting that relationship early on. So if you're a data center builder, you've identified that, you know, you want a, a Microsoft or Amazon or a Meta or whoever it is in, in your data center, um, or you have that relationship prior and, and you kind of, from the beginning, you start designing and building with that in mind. What happens in reality in terms of when those contracts are signed um, and when those data centers are actually built, that's always the trick um, because every data center operator will have kind of their own regulations, their own regulations, but their, their kind of template designs and what they want to do. Do we go block redundant? Do we go distributed redundant? Uh, what kind of storage do we allow meter squared, you know, for the office based on megawatts, all these type of things. But then the operators come with their own uh um well, the hyperscalers come with their own requirements on top of that so to answer your question you know many of them come and say hey we don't accept block redundant or we want distributed redundant but we only want you know four to make three we want not going to accept the six to make five or whatever um we want a certain storage requirement we want a connectivity maybe as part of a standard data center from a fiber perspective you know you generally only allow and you know an a and a b uh, independent connect with uh, connectivity but some of the hyperscalers you know want to third uh, a third route, you know, C route for connectivity. So more from what we see on there, and it's just kind of the, the resilience. Um, I think when you, again, a, a Microsoft or a Meta or a Google or these type of guys, you've got really the, the global market kind of at your peril in terms of if you have a security breach within a facility in you know, Nairobi, for instance, um, it can affect your facilities in, in Germany or, you know, San Francisco or where, where, wherever else you have it. So I think it's more from a resilient perspective that that they have these requirements met throughout, which can be quite tricky because, again, you know, if you're building a data center in, in Johannesburg, for example, like we discussed, it's got different risks to building in Lagos or in, you know, into Frankfurt or something like that. Um, so they certainly come with a lot of the requirements, um, security being being a big one, um, again, for the for the big guys. You know, that they need that data to be secured wherever it's stored. International a breach is a it's an international breach. Um and then they certainly are as well pushing on to the so the ESG side in terms of having, you know, looking at, you know, minimum PUEs, you know, what equipment to use, uh, these type of things. So so that's kind of what we see from a from a hyperscaler um uh, perspective. Hyperscalers are already in South Africa but their presence elsewhere on the continent is still limited. We've discussed green energy before, but do hyperscalers really care about the power source? They they do some some more than others. Um, I think, you know, if you've read the the news over the last month or two, um, nuclear within data centers has has gone, you know, um, it's got a lot of a lot of traction. So I think Google have, have recently announced that they're doing it. Microsoft have recently announced it, and that's for kind of powering their, their own facilities. Um, so from what we've seen, they kind of want to push that s- similar ideas or ideology onto data centers that they are say buying space in or buying racks in to put their stuff up. They're not so prescriptive and say that hey, you must, have, for instance, have your power, your facility must be powered by nuclear. 
Um, but there are some requirements that they say, okay, you need to have an X percentage um, of green energy, or you need to prove that you're wheeling energy or, or something from that perspective, because ultimately, and, and that is good as part of the, a lot of the regulations that are being um, uh, put into place. For example, we use the Germany uh, as an example again, where you now need to report PUEs and you, know, you, you need to report energy mixes and all these type of things that is forcing the hyperscalers to put those requirements back onto their kind of third party um, clients or their third party uh, uh, collaborators. Um, where, where they need to report these things. So, so yes, um, from a green perspective, but not necessarily pushing down and saying, I'm not going to take the facility because it's being powered off, you know, general electricity from a, from a coal power station. We want um, a, a nuclear, for example. To find out more, I called Nira Shah from IX Africa. They are one of the operators building with a hyperscaler focus. These are my notes from the call. While hyperscalers haven't arrived at scale, Niraj believes they will, eventually. The delay? These giants are still building out in the priority markets like the Middle East. Africa could be next. But for now, Africa isn't yet a top priority. Still, operators need to design for the future and adapt to constantly shifting requirements. Next, James Hutton Mills gives few points on why building capacity at scale in Africa could make sense. There are some countries in Europe where um, uh, uh, countries and perhaps cities as well, where uh, clearly the amount of power being dedicated to data centers is already high to the extent that you may see moratoriums uh, put in place to basically prevent new data centers being built. So for example, in Ireland, at least as I understand it, 15 to 20% of the power in Ireland is already dedicated to data centers, right? So that's a huge number. In uh, Amsterdam, um, I think I've seen a figure where somewhere between five to 10% um, of the power uh, in that city, not necessarily the Netherlands as a whole, but that city, uh, looks like it's going to be dedicated to um, to data centers. So you know you're you're already seeing some some cities where you know power constraints are very very meaningful. Um, uh, but it's not just access to power; it's also cost of power, right? And um, you know, particularly in Europe, where um, the long run marginal cost of new entry for power is very much driven by gas and you have you know the continued issues with russia and ukraine and pipelines and so forth um uh, and you're seeing gas prices now running at two year highs in europe um you know fundamentally the cost of power is um is an issue in um in africa it's kind of the reverse not every country has very high cost of power, but a lot of countries in Africa have poor networks. So their transmission and distribution networks are um, old, weak, unreliable, and need significant capex for reinforcement. So in um, selecting where one wants to build a data center, whether it be AI inference, AI training, or cloud, it's incredibly important not just to be able to deliver low cost power, but also reliable power. And there are some parts of Africa where, um, unfortunately, we are using diesel generators 75% of the time. Now, to put that into context, if you were building a power station in the UK uh, or in France or in Finland or in the US, you would use backup generation, such as diesel generators, probably less than 1% of the time annualized, right? So if you have other parts of the world where you're using diesel generators 50 to 75% of the time in certain countries, that I would argue is, is highly problematic, not just from a climate perspective, but also from a cost of power perspective, right? So to come back to your point, I think there are 
um, opportunities to build AI inference, AI training, and indeed cloud um, country by country in Africa. But you have to be selective about those countries precisely because um, you know, reliability of networks is, is so critical. And also cost of power is obviously very important as well. Despite the power reliability challenges in Africa, hyperscalers may also see potential. There's land, green energy, and connectivity is improving. But still, why the wait? I call Vertib, a global provider of critical infrastructure, to still find more. One, hyperscaler delays aren't limited to Africa. It's across the whole EMEA region, driven by fast-changing design specifications to accommodate the changing needs of AI infrastructure. Two, building in Africa is more expensive due to tariffs and import costs, making return on investment a concern. Three, in regions with weak data privacy laws, some customers may prefer hosting in Europe or the Middle East. Adil al Yousafi, CEO of Africa Data Centers, already has hyperscaler tenants and believes AI will drive the future demand. In our work, we see that uh, now the data centers that are being designed take that into consider consideration in, in their designs very heavily. So, so that's, that's clearly something that people are betting on. However, I've heard, heard different voices as well, where people say that now, nah, you know, especially when it comes to AI training, uh, there's an opinion that, um, well, where the AI training is happening mostly is in the US. And the opinion was that they want to keep it close to them and not keep those training facilities or decentralize them in any way uh, across the world. What do you think of that? Um, I think we need to focus on what we can control, right, as African yeah. uh, businesses and, uh, and African citizens. Um, we cannot left, uh, be left behind uh, in, in, in this new development in, the, um, in technology. And as I said earlier, uh, all these technology investments have allowed Africa actually to leapfrog some of the challenges that it has faced. Um, uh, today, in many countries, uh, you have actually a faster mobile internet connectivity than in Europe or in the US. Okay. Um, you have, uh, in some countries, you have uh, businesses who are embracing uh, digital presence faster than maybe in the so-called developed world because, uh, because there is no choice. You have to leapfrog all, all the stages of development that maybe uh, are not available to you because of the difficult uh, local difficulties. And I have no doubt that uh, our governments, our businesses, uh, will do what's necessary, right, to uh, again harness the advantages of uh, artificial intelligence. Um, we've seen, uh, obviously, uh, lately um, uh, development outside of the US uh, in terms of improving efficiency of training AI models and it's significantly reducing the cost of doing that. Obviously, as Africans, we and, and I think everyone in the world is very interested in that because yeah. uh, if we can significantly reduce the cost of accessing the technology, then it will benefit everyone. Uh, so um, uh, we are looking forward to uh, actually play our part as Africa data centers and as Ascava Cassava technologies through our different business lines in actually uh, bringing uh, and, um, and enabling um, uh, African, uh, African artificial intelligence. At the time of recording this, news just came in. The parent company of Africa data centers, Cassava Group, just announced a partnership with NVIDIA to build AI factories in five different countries. So far, it is just an announcement, but clearly an indicator that things are moving. AI is changing everything, from power densities to infrastructure needs. Hyperscalers might still be focused elsewhere, but Africa is very much on their radar. The challenge is clear. Build for what's coming, not just what's here. That means future-proof designs, aligning with evolving requirements, and ensuring energy is green, cheap, and reliable. Will hyperscalers scale in Africa? 100%. Potentially, it can still take a few years, but the first wave is already here. In the next episode, we'll explore what's next for African data centers. Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Ville Vaklin, and this is Why Should We Care About African Data Centers.
This podcast is part of the Data Governance in Africa initiative, helping the African Union shape data policies, enable cross-border data flows, and build secure, sustainable digital infrastructure. Funded by the EU and five member states, it supports a unified digital market in Africa.